Luis Antonio Gokim Tagle was born in Manila on June 21, 1957. Hulaan na lang kung anong kanyang edad ngayon. After completing elementary and high school at the CICM run St. Andrew's School in Paranaque City, he studied philosophy at the Ateneo de Manila University as a seminarian of San Jose Major Seminary, graduating summa cum laude and as philosophy departmental awardee. He obtained his degree in theological studies from the Loyola School of Theology in 1982. Chito as he is fondly called, was ordained to the priesthood on February 27, 1982, and became associate pastor at St. Augustine Parish in Mendez, Cavite, until 1985. During this time, he also taught theology at San Carlos Seminary, Loyola School of Theology and Divine Word Seminary, and was spiritual director, then rector of the Diocesan Seminary of Imus, Tahanan ng mabuting pastol in Tagaytay City. He was sent to further studies in sacred theology at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., where he obtained a doctorate in sacred theology in 1991. In 1997, Pope John Paul II, now Saint John Paul II, appointed him member of the International Theological Commission of the Vatican. And in the following year, an expert at the Special Assembly of the Synod of Bishops for Asia that took place in Rome. The Pope then appointed him Bishop of Imus and was ordained to the Episcopacy by His Eminence, Jaime Cardinal Sin, on December 12, 2001. Pope Benedict XVI appointed him as the 32nd Archbishop of Manila on October 13, 2011 succeeding Gaudencio Cardinal Rosales. He then named Archbishop Chito to the College of Cardinals on October 24, 2012, the seventh Filipino admitted to the college. Pope Benedict XVI has appointed Cardinal Tagle to various positions, including membership in the Congregation for Catholic Education, the 13th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops on the New Evangelization, the Presidential Committee of the Pontifical Council for the Family and the Pontifical Council for the Pastoral Care of Migrants and Itinerant Peoples. Since 2014, Pope Francis has appointed Cardinal Tagle to the Pontifical Council for the Laity, the Sacred Congregation for the Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life, the Sacred Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples, and the Pontifical Council Cor Unum for Human and Christian Development. Cardinal Chito was also appointed President Delegate of the Synod of Bishops on the Family, President of Caritas International, and most recently, President of the Catholic Biblical Federation. But perhaps what sets Cardinal Tagle apart is the way he communicates to his flock, open, joyful, compassionate, caring. As Emeritus Archbishop Cardinal Ricardo Vidal wrote, he is the bishop who can both laugh and weep with his people. Cardinal Tagle is a man truly in love with God and with his church. Talagang laudato si ang kanyang personality. Ladies and gentlemen, His Eminence Luis Antonio Cardinal Tagle. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Maraming salamat, Father Joe, sa napakaganda mong sinabi. Dalangin ko lamang na sana totoo yun. 
Uh, I would like to thank Father Jet Villarin and uh, the Ateneo de Manila community and the Manila Observatory community for inviting me to give this keynote address as we celebrate the 150th anniversary of this wonderful institution at the service of science and faith and human development, the Manila Observatory. And we also celebrate this milestone of an encyclical from Pope Francis, a Jesuit Pope, Laudato Si Mi Signore. Praise be to you, my Lord. My task this morning is uh, to give you some sort of an introduction to the uh, encyclical. I could give that introduction in one minute summarizing everything by saying, please read the encyclical. <laughs> this talk cannot be a substitute to reading the encyclical itself. But I have to warn you, it is the longest encyclical so far written by a pope in the history of the church. Well, I think the topic calls for a comprehensive approach and uh, we thank the Pope and his collaborators for such a successful outcome in Laudato Si. So after giving you a background of the uh, encyclical, I will indicate from my point of view a few things that I think merit our continuing reflection and hopefully action. This title, no? comes from the invocation of St. Francis of Assisi, the Canticle of Creatures, when Pope Francis chose the name Francis in the conclave that elected him, I was there. <laughs> People started murmuring, Francis who? Savior? After all, he's a Jesuit, but he was quick to clarify, Francis the Poverello, Francis of Assisi. And true to form, this saint, who is called also the patron of ecology, becomes the inspiration of this encyclical. The Pope reminds us of our common home our sister, our Mother Earth. Sister Earth who now cries out to all of us because of the harm inflicted on her due to our irresponsible use or abuse of the goods God has endowed her. And the response that Pope Francis proposes to all of us really comes from Pope John Paul II, a global ecological conversion. We are happy that conversion is now linked to ecology and global at that. So the key concept that the encyclical proposes to us is integral ecology. To articulate the fundamental relationship of the human person Personhood is relationship. We are related to God. We are related to ourselves. We are related with other human beings. We are created to the earth and to the whole of the environment. Let us keep in mind that this is the key concept, integral ecology. Now, the different chapters of the encyclical can be considered as steps that we can take in order to enter this world that is being opened to us, the world of integral ecology. So, the first chapter, what is happening to our common home? Now, we can consider this as the step of listening, viewing spiritually, and listening spiritually to scientific research. 
science and spirituality. Let us listen to the results of the best scientific research on environmental matters that are available to us. The Holy Father proposes this. Science, as at its best, can help us listen to the cry of the earth. What a beautiful way of putting the task of science. Science, at its best, can help us listen to the cry of the earth. Now, the Holy Father did his own listening and his own seeing. He pointed to the following things, pollution, waste, premature deaths, deaths of children. The earth looks like a pile of filth. <coughs> And he says, at the root of it is the throwaway culture. We throw away anything that we don't find useful, even human beings. Elections are coming. You see a lot of throwaway culture being manifested. The climate, the changes affect entire populations and in fact, it is not just war, ethnic battles that cause migration. We have a lot of people who migrate because of ecological or climate changes. Water, contaminated water, and the poor deprived of access to water. That's why there is a move to declare access to water as a basic universal human right. The loss of biodiversity, the extinction of plants and animal species, an extinction that changes the whole ecosystem. And the Pope reminds us that species are not just exploitable resources. As we tap into them, we should be sensitive to the effects no, on the whole ecosystem and life. The decline in the quality of human life and the breakdown of society. The Pope questions the growth model that uh, prevails. It does not always lead to integral development. I'm very happy to note that here in the Philippines, the past two years, there have been a lot of fora dedicated to inclusive growth. People are now asking, how could growth really embrace everyone? For a while there is growth being registered, it seems that it excludes many people. How do we achieve growth that includes everyone, especially the poor? Cities are becoming unlivable, but they say 70% of the world's population now lives in cities and cities are expanding and in the cities there's very little contact with nature in fact in one meeting on evangelizing big metropolitan centers i raised that question the parables of jesus christ are agriculture rural based the fishes of the sea, the mustard seed. I mean, when people live in the city, mustard, that's uh, for the hot dog. <laughs> mustard seed that grows into a big shrub. I mean, what does that mean to them? You talk about the sun, the stars. Do they see the stars? They see illuminated lead advertisements. We need to search for new parables and new mediations of God's presence. That's not in the encyclical. <laughs> Global inequality. The Pope says the poorest, the poorest people are the most vulnerable you know, when climatic changes happen. So the true ecological approach is also social. In the line that was made famous by Pope Francis, he says the cry of the earth 
and the cry of the poor, they come together. These are some points which the Holy Father uh, raises in the first chapter. So maybe we can do our own listening. We can do our own looking at our own contexts and add to the list that the Holy Father has just given to us. The segue to the second chapter is quite uh, typical of Pope Francis's style. He just avoids, you know, all of this uh, convoluted diplomatic language. He says he's not happy with leadership in the world right now, especially with political leadership. There's no willingness, there's no determination to implement change. And with that, he leads us to the second chapter, which is the gospel of creation. He picks up from the wealth of the Judeo-Christian tradition, particularly the biblical texts and theological reflections on those texts, he relies heavily also on not only his predecessors and their encyclicals, homilies, and teachings. He uses a lot of the pastoral statements issued by Episcopal conferences all over the world. So aside from talking about integral ecology, the methodology that he employs in this encyclical is also that of collegiality. He brings into the papal magisterium different teachings from the national and regional Episcopal conferences. The bishops of the Philippines issued a statement in the 1980s. The Pope quotes that. The Asian Bishops Conferences also had a study on ecology. The Pope quotes from that document. Now, the gospel of creation. He directs the Christians to the wealth of our tradition. He says, while it is true that the ecological concerns require interdisciplinary approaches, an interdisciplinary dialogue, we cannot exclude religion, faith, spirituality. Faith traditions have a lot to share to the whole world about caring for our common home. Our biblical accounts, we have a God the God who liberates is the same God who creates. In fact, historically, Israel got to know God first as the God who saves, the God who liberates, the God who uses the forces of nature in order to liberate God's people. From liberation to creation, those two should not be separated. Creation liberation into full human dignity. That is what our God is all about. And human life is grounded in relationships with God, with neighbors, and with the earth. According to our Judeo-Christian tradition, the earth is a gift. It is not a possession. God possesses it. We are not the owners. We are stewards. That's why in the tradition of the church, ab uh, private property is never absolute. When the common good requires it, then you must be able to give up, let go of private property property. For us, the theological underpinning is that we are not owners. So 
you know, save yourself the, the trauma and the trouble. When somebody borrows money from you, do not think of it as your money. So that when it is not returned, you don't get angry. <laughs> it's not mine. <laughs> That's how I face it. <laughs> Kasi pag inisip mong akin yan, inutang sa akin, lalo kang galit. No? Pag inisip mo, di man akin yan eh. Pinadaan lang sa kamay ko. Nasa kanyang kamay na. Pag dumaan ulit sa akin, salamat. Kung hindi, walang nawala sa akin. Kasi hindi naman akin yun eh. Try it. Try it now. Mangutang kayo sa katabi nyo. Tignan natin kung laudato si. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's not in the encyclical. <laughs> now, each creature has a purpose. Very Franciscan. Very Franciscan. Even in the weeds, St. Francis would see beauty and purpose. Very Christ-like. And there is interconnection, interrelatedness between creatures. The earth is a shared inheritance. That's why the goods of the earth are destined for all and not just for a few. Jesus, the Word of God, through whom everything was created in the fullness of time, became a creature, became matter, became flesh. And the incarnation of the Son of God blessed creation all the more. He lived this earth. He lived on this earth just like one of us. He died here and was buried on the earth, but brought the earth to the resurrection, into the fullness of life in God. A rich tradition. That leads us to the third chapter or the third step. After seeing both the situation and the richness of the Judeo Christian tradition, now the analysis. The human roots of the ecological crisis. The human roots. And the Holy Father is not content with symptoms. He wants to go to the roots. He identifies some, and he invites us to converse with him, to dialogue with him in his analysis, and again, for us to add our own inputs. First, he says, a misuse of technology. While technology is very good, and we can uh, all attest to the benefits that we are enjoying thanks to technology, there is a way of uh, using technology that becomes pride, dominance, economic, political dominance. He says technology needs sound ethics. A, uh, a, a culture that will allow limits and self-restraint. He says, part of the problem is that technology opens to us so many possibilities. And one, <laughs> one uh, direction of pride is, if we can do it, we should do it. He says, that's pride. Is there no limit anymore? Is there no more self-restraint? Another root cause for him is this uh, misguided anthropocentrism. The view of the person as possessing full dominion over nature. So he says we need to recover the sense of responsible stewardship. We should protect life. And here, he says, part of pride is the manipulation of human life, especially in abortion. That's pride for him. 
Another cause, practical relativism. Since I am the owner, since I am the boss, I disregard laws. I disregard principles. I disregard truth. They are not upheld. Laws are avoided rather than implemented for the common good. And he says that's rooted in this practical relativism. Everything is relative to me. I'm the only absolute. I am the owner. Then he says another root, the loss of the value of labor. We need to protect employment. We need to protect the laborer. And work is not just for income. Work is for human development. With work, I grow as a human being. People ask me, why do you continue teaching? You're already laden with work. Listening to Father Joe Kilong Kilong enumerate my tasks, I felt tired. I said, wow, is that you, Cheeto? Is that the story of your life? You know? But when people ask me, why do you continue teaching? You're already a bishop, you're a cardinal. I said, that's the type of work where I've experienced human development. I don't find it tiring. Even if you don't pay me, I will teach. That's true. But you have to take care of the laborer. <laughs> But how many people work because they find joy, development in their place of work? How many? I don't know. But the Holy Father is alerting us to that. New biological technologies, genetically modified organisms. He admits that there have been some gains, but some problems remain and they need to be addressed. So, he is inviting all of us to a broad, responsible, scientific, and social discussion, even debate, on these causes, these roots of the ecological crisis. The fourth chapter contains his proposal, Integral Ecology, centered on the human person. Let us find our unique place. And we already mentioned the human person is relational. Find your place in the world by rediscovering your relationships with God, with yourself, with other people, and with the environment. This integral ecology will provide a new paradigm of justice for how how do we conceive of justice when we are always connected? What type of justice will it be? What concept or notions of justice will arise if they are rooted in connectedness, human connectedness with everyone? So environmental, social, human issues are always related. Here are some elements of the integral ecology that he proposes. First, as I had already said, economic, social, human, and environmental concerns are interrelated. Yung ating singer, si Joey Ayala, di ba? Meron siyang kanta, ang lahat ng bagay ay magkaugnay. Yan. Yan yun. Everything is connected. All creatures form a network that will remain a mystery that we will never fully understand. We will continue uh, exploring that, especially through scientific research. But knowledge needs to be integrated into a broader vision that relates the ecosystem to social integration, to institutional decisions for the common good, and quality of life. The second, he says, 
integral ecology includes cultural ecology. Remember the Pope's speech to the families when he was here in the Mall of Asia. He alerted us to what he called ideological imperialism or colonialization. Now, it appears again here. Cultural ecology. Part of our ecology is the culture. So he says, what he is proposing now in taking care of the environment is take care also of your cultural environment, your cultural treasures, the treasures of humanity. And here, he issues a special appeal for the protection of the rights and the cultures of the indigenous peoples whose cultures are neglected and destroyed in the name of so-called development. The third, the ecology of daily life. He says, look at the urban uh, environment, those in charge of uh, urban planning. Is there public space? Is there sufficient space for housing? How is transportation? The relationship between human life and the moral law. We don't have absolute power over our properties, our bodies, etc. Then he proposes again what is contained in the Catholic social teachings, the common good. He calls on everyone to make choices in solidarity based on option for the poorest and the most vulnerable. Bring the excluded into the center of our planning and our choices. And finally, integral ecology includes justice between generations. We should not look only at our generation and what we need. We should look to the future generations, what type of world will we pass on to them? The poor of today and the generations of the future should be very much present in our planning, in our decisions, in our choice of lifestyle. Are you still with Pope Francis? <laughs> the fifth chapter, we're coming to a close here. The fifth chapter now leads to action, lines of approach and action for the renewal of international, national, and local policies. He invites the business sector, government sector, to review their decision-making processes. So here in this chapter, he really invites the working together of those in politics, those in business, those in the sciences and technology, and those in religion. He says, think of our world with, with a common perspective or a common plan. Let us not let the destiny of the world be determined by a few countries and a few influential people. Politics and business should abandon short-sighted efficiency or profit orientation or short-term electoral success. Yung ang dami-daming pinapangako no, para lang may makuhang boto and then hindi naman ma-sustain. No. Alam na natin lahat yun. <laughs> the Pope also calls for honest, honest and transparent decision-making so as not to harm the most disadvantaged. Avoid corruption which conceal, which conceal real intentions and deals. Tapos later on, dun mo makikita. 
pinag-usapan naman pala. Tinago lang. Politics and business for human development. He says the market forces cannot be allowed by themselves to dictate on us. For market forces cannot safeguard envir the environment and human development. Maybe we should slow down production, sabi niya, so that people will develop. <laughs> Bahala na yung mga, ano, no? Uh, and let us review notions of progress and development. Ako tinatanong ko lagi yan eh. No? Are, are the models of progress and development that we propose to people, no? are, they, are they the models that are really appropriate for them or that the, uh, the models that they desire? Uh -huh. Science and religion must work together. They need each other. And the various religions should also work together, share their insights with one another. You know, uh, the Office of Theological Concerns of the Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences issued a study uh, on caring for the environment. But uh, it included a whole section on what the other Asian religions say about uh, caring for the earth, what Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Islam, you know, and we, we discovered there's a lot that we can, uh, that we hold in common, which could be a starting point for our common action too. Uh, so, yun. And the final, you know, the final uh, section is about ecological education and spirituality. Guidelines for Christian, now it's more for the Christians, Christian spiritual ecological conversion. And here, the Holy Father breaks protocol. No? He enumerates little actions that could be done and should be done. In fact, some people were surprised. They said, that this last portion doesn't sound like a regular papal encyclical no. because he went he went to details like uh, watch your water consumption turn off the <laughs> the light if you don't if you don't need it if you're not using it no check your lifestyle no uh, how about the attitude of gratitude is is it still alive do people still give thanks it says Go back to praying grace before meals and go back to saying grace after meals. Yes. Uh, sobriety, generosity, happiness in simplicity, daily gestures that will break the cycle of violence, exploitation, selfishness. Then, he says, do you still find time to rest? Last Wednesday, I mean yesterday, <laughs> I'm operating on different time zones, so I'm confused. What day is today? Thursday. So yesterday, no, the Holy Father mentioned that in his, uh, in his um, audience, no? uh, Wednesday audience, he said, yeah, don't become a slave of work. Work has become a god and we sacrifice everyone, including ourselves. We sacrificed our family, we sacrificed friendship, and we offer all of them as burnt offering to the god called work. Kaya pati yung mga laborers natin, sunog-sunog na. That's why the Sunday worship, the Sunday rest, no, is good for the environment and is good for the human ecology. So he ends with that worship, 
Uh -huh. For on the seventh day, God, the Creator, rested. Ay, nako. Oh, please read the encyclical. <laughs> uh, may I be given one more minute uh -huh. just to uh, uh, indicate a few things, no, which some commentators have said and have uh, the experts have also uh, 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 indica or, or uh, noticed in the encyclical. Very briefly, uh, Leonardo Both this uh, one of the mo ma main uh, exponents of the theology of liberation, said, reading the encyclical, he noticed a very Latin American uh, uh, approach to the realities, the methodology employed by the Holy Father. See, judge, act, and celebrate. Well, that is not purely Latin American. Since Vatican II, it has become some sort of a, a methodology. But I am very happy when he added that, because even in Asian circles, we always say, see, judge, act. But the Pope would always add, in the end, celebrate, celebrate. For that will remind us that the horizon is that of gift rather than function only, gift. When you look at people, do you see a gift or do you see someone that could be used? When you see an object, do you see a gift or do you see something that could be manipulated? No. Celebrate. So after this uh, forum, there will be celebration. <laughs> then, uh, there is this uh, uh, scholar from Naples, Alex Sanotelli. He, reading this, he said, yes, the, 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 uh, the challenges of the Holy Father are real. Uh, and he affirms that the most original for him in the, uh, of the in encyclical is uniting the cry of the poor with the cry of the earth. Integral ecology, a total listening. And he says the church is a privileged community to be able to do this, to, res to respond to this. But that will require for us in the church a meeting of faith and life. The faith professed and the living of that faith. We say, I believe in God, the creator. I say it, I profess it. But my life, my lifestyle might betray that I don't really believe in God, the creator. Maybe I believe in myself as God, the creator. So he says, yeah, the challenge of this encyclical to the church is review the faith that we profess. And how far are we from living it? He, he even mentions Thomas Berry. He says, Thomas Berry once noted that we have already formulated a moral response to suicide, homicide, genocide. Now we need to formulate a moral response to biocide and geocide, killing the earth, killing life. Bagong ano yun, project ng Manila Observatory and siguro Loyola School of Theology, mga side-side. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, Gael Giraud, a Jesuit, a French Jesuit. He, he he's very happy that the Holy Father addresses this, this uh, encyclical to all peoples. After all, the earth is our common home. And he says, there is a growing awareness in Europe uh, regarding the role of religion and religious traditions in participating in public discussions, sharing their unique wisdoms. And uh, he says that maybe through this dialogue between politics and religion, the politicians could have 
could uh, acquire greater courage in regulating you know, concerns and markets for the common good. So let us draw resources from the faith and let us share that. No? Now there are two sociologists based in Milan and what they, they, they stressed in the encyclical is the new humanism that the Holy Father is presenting to us. It's not new in the sense that it has been concocted recently by Pope Francis. It is rooted in the biblical tradition, but it is being proposed anew a rediscovery of the person as relational. And he says, she's, and both of them said, if the person is relational, then human freedom must always be relational. Freedom must be exercised in responsibility for the others. Freedom cannot be invoked as an excuse for separating myself from others and even harming others no, just because I am free. If I am a person in relationship, then even my freedom and my choices must consider the impact or the consequences on others. Chiara Giacardi even quotes uh, Anna Arendt. Anna Arendt said that there are two, in our times, two symbolic killings. The killing of God the Father and the killing of Mother Earth. So she asks the question, if you do not have God as Father and you do not have the Earth as Mother, then ano ka? You are not anymore a child of someone. You are just you. You are not connected with anyone anymore. So he said, she, Hannah Arendt asked the question, what happens to gratitude? What happens to respect? What happens to sisterhood and brotherhood? What happens to tenderness when you do not have a father, when you do not have a mother? Caring. The Holy Father loves to talk about tenderness. Do not be afraid to care tenderly. And for him, caring is not being a spy, no. doing some surveillance work. No, it is an attentive look at the other because I am concerned. It is a nurturing look so that I promote what is good and beautiful in the other. And it is that look that regenerates the other. And I must take care of myself too not to dominate others, not to rebel, not to destroy, but to take care and to help others bloom. And finally, another Jesuit, Giacomo Costa, who is the editor of Aggiornamenti Sociali, says, for us Christians and educators, let us pay attention to the, the little actions, the gestures that the Holy Father proposes. Remember in Evangelii Gaudium, the Holy Father already said, reality is greater than ideas. So here he said, you're always talking about ideas. <laughs> Go to reality, do something, say grace before meals. Say thank you. Those are the things that will make that will that will make a dent. Not your beautiful ideas only. It doesn't mean we don't need ideas. But without the gestures, nothing will change, he says. And then conversion. And he calls for patience. The Holy Father calls for patience. Just like any conversion, if <laughs> Uh, we need time. And the Holy Father believes in that. Time is greater than space. So patience. Move through time. But every time, <laughs> at every moment in time, do some little acts, some gestures for that. And rest. Chito. 
find time to rest. <laughs> I should say this to myself. No, yeah. Uh, for resting, yun namang iba rest naman ng rest. Please do not use this as an excuse. Ha? Again, uh, yung, yung tawa kasi nung iba parang nakakaloko eh. Ano? <laughs> Nababasa ko na eh. Ano? But resting here is not just for, for mental and uh, physical recuperation. No? For we are part of a delicate world. We are also delicate. No? But it is also a spiritual act. When you rest, you let go, and you really say, the world is in the hands of someone mightier than I am. I may disappear now, and I'm sure the world will continue now, thanks to the providential God. I started by referring to St. Francis of Assisi, whose name Pope Francis took. But at the end of the encyclical, I told myself, after reading it, Oh, come on, Pope Francis, you cannot hide it. You are the son of Ignatius. <laughs> you are the son of Ignatius. I could see strains of the first principle and foundation, the purpose of creation, to glorify God. And the whole of creation is given to you so that you, could be of service to God and to God's kingdom and have the courage to let go when you are misusing creation and creation is not anymore leading you to God. Be simple. And everything moves in the horizon of gift. Lahat ng ito ay mula sa iyo. Muli kong handog sa iyo. Hindi naman akin eh. Galing naman sa iyo. So I could be free. I am not attached. I am not domineering. Because everything is gift. Just give me your love. And I have everything. Teach me to be generous. Pope Francis, you are the son of Ignatius. Through and through. Thank you very much for your patience.